You're listening to the Atlanta Dream Center Church Podcast. If you'd like to support this ministry, you can give at www.dreamcenterchurch.com, where every dollar helps advance the kingdom of God. We hope that this message edifies and encourages you to do the great things God has called you to do. Hey, listen, I'm going to get right into this word. I told you that because I, I said it after I did all the announcements. But I want to get into this word. It's pretty simple. In fact, I was telling my wife, this is such a basic truth, um, that sometimes as you're speaking, you want to bring a revelation that would rock everybody. I grew up, and I was under my dad, and my dad would always preach. And I don't know if you know this, but when you know someone well and you get used to them, you stop listening. Does anyone know what I'm talking about? Where are my married people at? Where are my married people at? I, you don't know how many times I've done marriage counseling, and we'll tell a couple or someone in the couple, like, you just need to do this. And it hits. I'm like, oh, my gosh, that's brilliant. And then the spouse goes, I've been saying those same exact words for years, you know? And some things just change, right? Sometimes you just get used to hearing people and you change it. Uh, it changes how you receive from them. And so I ended up being under uh, uh, all sorts of podcasts. I listened to sermons and every sermon, if I wasn't getting some radical, revolutionary truth, I didn't feel like I was being fed. And so what happened as a speaker now, I, I kind of adopted that. And there's, a, there's, there's two things to that. There's a good part where you know the Lord better, but then there's a bad part where you forget the fundamental truths of Jesus, now, I want to encourage you today on something really fundamental and something that I, I, I'm titling the service today as focus. In fact, I, I, I'll be honest with you. I'm, I'm looking at this, this sermon. I'm thinking, man, this might turn into a series. You guys okay if I turn it into a series? Yeah? Yeah? Good. One person's ready for that. I'm, I'm with that. Hey, where's my coffee? Oh, is that it? Oh, thanks. You gave me the more full one. I think that was actually yours. Thanks. And a water. I tell you it's water, but it's actually just vodka. It's just the relax while I'm up here speaking. <laughs> I'm kidding. It's Mountain Valley Spring Water. It's, I promise. It's a refill, actually, from the back. So I want to get our focus realigned. And uh, if there's something I've, I've dealt with, there's something I know other people deal with, is that sometimes in our Christian walk, our focus gets off. And we do something, and this is probably the most basic of things that we could focus on, is that sometimes we get so focused on something really simple. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring out a ton of scriptures today. So if you're taking notes, I'm reading a lot of scripture. I'm not reading chapters. I'm going to go through all sorts of different books. You're talking one or two verses. But I just want to show you that you and I need to realign our focus onto something that's really basic and truthful, and you know it, but I know you don't live by it. And today, my encouragement to, do, to you today is to live by what the Word of God says to you. Is that okay if I encourage you on that? So I want to pray. I'm going to tell you a story, and then we're going to jump right into the, story, into the Scriptures. Father, I pray over every one of us that our ears would be open, not to the sermon, but to what the Spirit of the Lord is saying today. God, we believe that your Holy Spirit is here. It says in scriptures, Jesus, I love this time out. Who was here on Wednesday night for the worship night, man? Did you guys enjoy that? That was a blast, man. I was, I was jamming. Sorry, God. I just wanted to make sure people applauded that because it was fun. Father, you said when you're going up to heaven, as you resurrected God and everybody was looking at you thinking there's nothing better than you, that Jesus, they were saying, don't leave us. You said, I must go for I'm going to send another. And God, we just want to say right now, we know that your Holy Spirit is part of your plan. And we believe in it, Father. We believe in him. We believe it's the spirit of you. And we're asking over all of us, Jesus, that your Holy Spirit would reveal the thoughts and the word of you in our hearts. And God, I pray over this sermon, this basic truth, that Father, it would help us not just get through the week, but to make our lives aligned with you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Growing up, uh, you know, I'm a pastor's kid, you know, and I was the best pastor's kid that he ever had. Yeah, that, that's right. You hear that, Hannah? He said the best. He really just said that. Yeah, yeah, take that note down. All right, so me, uh, I grew up, and I, I loved going to church. I loved doing ministry, and I loved praying for people. And I, I'm saying that because that's what I was raised in. That's how we walked. That's how my dad walked. And so it was easy for me to do. And I would come to church every week qualified. This is how I felt. I felt qualified to come and do prayer. I felt qualified to share the ministry of Jesus Christ with people. I'd even feel qualified on the street to tell people about Jesus. But then something would happen to me. Uh, uh, maybe late at night, I'd have, uh, I'd have lust, or maybe at late at night, or better yet, I would lie. I think lying is a sin we never talk about enough. We all lie too much. Let's be honest. Let's be honest. We all lie. <laughs> That's a Kanye song. 
It's a Kanye song. Yeah, yeah. Don't listen to Kanye, you little heathens. I'm just kidding. I, I'm just kidding. And I would lie. I, I'd make up some dumb lie. You know, maybe it would be to my dad. I'd show up to work late. And my dad would always tell me, you know, he'd always tell us, don't show up to work late. You know, have some respect for the calling that you have in your life. And I would show up late. You know, I'd show up an hour late because I was a bum. I'm going to be honest with you. I liked sleeping in. Work wasn't that important to me. It was more of my privilege and less about my responsibility. It was more like I am the youth pastor here. That's a big deal. And less about the responsibility I care. And so I, I would walk in late. And my dad say, hey, where you been? And I'd say something like, oh, traffic was so bad. <laughs> or I'd say something like, oh, you know, I just uh, slept through my alarm clock. And usually, and Susie will testify, the reality of it was I was usually late. Sometimes that was true, but usually I was late because I was just bumming around the house. I was playing a video game. And I went a little too long. And so I ended up lying. And then I'd feel bad. And I didn't want to tell my dad I was lying. And I'd have what was called guilt. And then this guilt and condemnation would come over me. And then when it came for me to do ministry, to pray with someone, when it came to the part of preaching the gospel or telling people about Jesus, I would disqualify myself. And I would say, I'm just not in a good place to do that. I need to get God to love me again. And that's the thoughts I'd have. And then so what I would do is I'd go back to my, my, my office, which was kind of my bedroom too, and I'd, I'd go in there and I'd read the scriptures over and over and over. And I'd tell God, I'm so sorry, God. I'm so sorry, God. And the entire day I would dedicate to me trying to get God to be okay with me again. And I would strive to say, God, I just want you to be okay with me again. I don't want you to be upset at me anymore. And I, I had this image, not that God was up there like going to punch me in the face, but this would be the image of my head that I'd be shouting out to God and God's back would be turned to me like this. Almost like he was grieved and frustrated with what I did. And there's probably a truth to that. There's a grieving of the Holy Spirit. But what would happen to me is I wouldn't be able to do what he called me to do. Because I was so caught on this one thought, he doesn't love me right now. Or even more than that, because that's not actually the truest thought. The truest thought was, I'm unworthy, and I need to earn my respect back with him. It's actually, if I could just take this little story uh, about one time at a youth camp, I had a kid who was, who was uh, truthfully demon-possessed. If you don't know about this, you don't believe in this, then you don't read your Bible, you need to read your Bible, all right? And he was manifesting, and it was insane. I'm just going to go real quick what happened. He came up to me. Susie, can I use you? Because you're the only shoulder I want to lean on. Come here, baby. That was cute. He was gross. <laughs> He's jealous. It's Micah. And I'm going to be the kid who came up to me, and Susie's going to be me, and I had just messed up. The night before, I had so much lust in my heart. I remember waking up the next morning going, God, I'm so sorry I dwelt on those thoughts. And I'm at church, and he came up to me and said, Tom, I need you to pray for me. I, I just, my stomach hurts. So I'm like, okay, I'll pray for you. And I'm thinking in my head I'm not worthy. So I put my head on his shoulder. Oh, yeah, I'm the kid. Come here. Yeah, I'm the kid. Come here. And I just sat there just like this. I didn't say a word. And in my mind, I sat there for about 15 seconds. And I don't, if you guys know, I'm pretty touchy, okay? And I'm trying to get better at it. Come here. Come here, baby. <laughs> this is all just a ploy to get her to love me. We were fighting this morning. No, I'm just kidding. No, I'm just kidding. Come here, come here, come here. <laughs> and I just sit in my heart, in my head, in my thoughts, because I just felt like there was something demonic. I said, I rebuke you, enemy. And this is what the kid does. I'm the kid. Susie's me. The kid goes like this. Aah! As soon as I say it, I'm thinking in my head, coincidence. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking in my head, no, you know, I know it feels like there might be something demonic, but I don't, I don't, I don't really think there's something demonic. So I'm going to test it out. So I sit there for about 15 more seconds. And in my head, I say, devil, I rebuke you. Aah! I'm not saying nothing. I'm just saying this in my head. Now I'm tripping out, right? So now I'm thinking, oh, shoot, oh, shoot. I don't know what to do. No one's ever taught me how to do this, right? Like, how do I cast on a demon? What am I going to do? So I'm sitting there, and, and I'm laying on his head, and this time I wait for an entire song to go by. Because I'm, I want to make sure this is a coincidence. I'm not going to start saying there's a demon in this kid, and he's just like, no, it was just, it hurt, you know? So I sit there. I finally go, okay, God, if he does it again, then I, I know what it is. So all right. Devil. This is all in my head, by the way. I'm not saying this out loud. Devil, I rebuke you. And the dude takes off running. Thanks, Tom. He takes off running, right? And he's gone. He runs to the back of the church. I'm like, oh, shoot, oh, shoot. And in the back of my head, I'm thinking, oh, God, I know you're not happy with me right now. 
That's what I'm thinking. I go there and I'm praying over them, I'm praying over them, and, and then it turns into, if you've ever dealt with this kind of stuff, it turns into a wrestling match, and that shouldn't, that's not Christian, but it happened that way. Because I'm thinking, I need to pray over this kid, and he's like on the ground, he's going, ah, and he's saying crazy things. I'm like, wrestle him on the ground. I'm like, no, God, you know, get him out. And I'm wrestling physically to get out the spiritual. It doesn't even make sense. And then all these pastors come in down and they come and they grab them too. And we're like, we should probably take them out because all the kids are looking. The kids are like watching, like, what's, they're beating up that poor kid. You know, we're going to be on Roll Star or something. And so we're like, let's take them outside. So we take them outside and he keeps telling me, you know, I, I was close to this kid. I still am. He says, Tom, I, I want to be free. I need help. I need help. I want to be free. And we're just praying over him. And then all the pastors are telling me stuff, man. I don't know what I'm doing, right? I'm just, I'm like at 21, 22. I guess we're married. So I was like 23 years old. And like, look in his eyes. And, and you have to make eye contact. I'm like, okay, you know. So I'm like looking at him, and he's like, you won't look at me. You know, I don't know what I'm doing. Finally, we take him into this room, and a pastor, the main speaker, he's a missionary in India, he comes into the room. He left the service because they said, hey, we got, we got something we want you to come be a part of. And he walks into the room, and he looks at him, and he says, you're bound by the enemy because you won't forgive your grandma, and you're not going to forgive your dad, and you haven't forgiven your uncle, the pastor doesn't know anything about this kid, but all three of those people had sexually abused this kid. They had ruined this kid's life, and I knew it. And as soon as he said it, I remembered just like two months earlier, I had a similar situation with him, and the Lord had told me exactly what the problem was. And I was sitting, we're, we're in a bedroom now in this, this cabin, and he's laying on the bed, and as soon as he speaks it over him, he just starts saying, I forgive you, Grandma. I forgive you, Dad. I forgive you, Uncle. And immediately everything changes. The kid's just crying. He's not convulsing. Nothing's wrong with him anymore. And I'm sitting down because well, I'm exhausted. I just wrestled this kid for like an hour and a half. I'm sitting down. I'm going, God, how did I miss you? And he said to me, because you forgot that I love you. And you were so focused on winning me back that when the opportunity showed up, you missed it. And I remember leaving that place feeling like overwhelmed, one with gratefulness that God saw my sin and he still loved me. But then also so unlearned and so foolish that I forgot that he loved me. And I got stuck. And so today I just want to go over some scriptures. I want to get your focus back on something. I want us to start focusing on the most important thing in this room. And the number one thing you don't need to focus on is whether or not God loves you. And I'm going to go through a bunch of scriptures. I'm going to read you a bunch of scriptures. I'm going to show you what the Bible says. Now, I want to say this. As Christians, it is by nature that you believe in the Bible. Yeah. By nature that you believe in the Bible. If you don't believe in the Bible, you're no longer a Christian. So I want to make this very clear that as Christians, we believe in the Bible. So I'm using the Bible to show you what I mean. I'm going to go to Romans 5, verse 8. They're all going to pop up here. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. What that scripture is saying to you and I right now is that he loves you so much that he loved you before you were even righteous. Before he even had the blood price for you, he loved you already. Now we go to the next one, John 3, 16. We all know this one. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. He says this. He says, man, I love this world. By the way, he's destroyed it with Noah already. He's destroyed cities in it. But he goes, but I love it. I'm going to send my son. Now, I want to make this clear. The world is not some other people. The world is you. I want to go to the next one. Romans 8.35. I love this scripture. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Who's going to separate you from God's love? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or pearl, pearl, peril, <laughs> pearls won't separate you either, you know? If you like pearls, I don't know. Or sword. <laughs> What's the next verse I got for you? Is that all I showed you? Oh, my bad. Let me read verse 36 too. I have it right here. If you don't, if you don't believe me, then open. Thank you. You believe me. Thank you. <laughs> it says this, as it is written for you, for your sake, we are killed all day long. We are accused as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Therefore, I am persuaded that neither death nor life, 
nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers. I want to make that really clear. There's no demonic force in this world, not even the forces of sin. I can't just say that. There's no demonic force, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. You're loved. This is Ephesians 3, 14 through 20. For this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, for whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, not the person next to you, he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and the length and the depth and the height to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power of the work in us. Before I go into these next scriptures, can I just tell you something? I don't care what happened last night. I don't care what happened over the last few years. God says, I'm not going to stop loving. That's not the issue. Yeah, hang on, though. Hang on, because I know some of y'all are still kind of hanging on. Well, well. Eh. Psalm 36, 5 through 7. Your mercy, O Lord, is in the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the clouds. Your righteousness is like the great mountains. Your judgments are a great deep. Oh, Lord, you preserve man and beast. Whew. How precious is your loving kindness, oh God. Therefore, the children of men put their trust under the shadow of your wings. 1 John chapter 3. Who just said, ooh, like that? Who just said that? <laughs> okay. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. Can I say that to you really quick? Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called servants, slaves. No, 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 no. Citizens. No, no, no. He says, I love you so much, I call you my children. I give you the spirit of adoption. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we shall know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Water. There's more scriptures. But for the sake of time, and the sake of not having to overemphasize this, what greater love is that than a man shall lay down his life for a friend? Your focus in your Christian walk should not be to make God love you. Can I say that again? Your Christian walk, your focus is not about earning or making God love you. Now, this sounds so simple that it might even fly over your head, but I want to talk to you about how you're walking with God. Too many of us are not walking in power because we think we're too di dirty and God doesn't have enough love for us to walk in it. Too many of us are disqualifying ourselves from ministry. I'm not talking about being disqualified by other people. I'm saying you're disqualifying yourself because you're saying I haven't done enough so I don't think he loves me enough to walk through me and work through me. Some of y'all are so focused on trying to make God happy with you that you feel condemned that you don't read your Bible enough. And you're going, God's not happy with me. You don't know how many times I hear this in the world. I want to come to church, but I got to get my life right. You know what they're saying? I, I, I want to be there. I want to be in his presence. I want to be loved by him, but I, I, I haven't earned it yet. I need to get my life right. I want to say this to everyone in here. I don't care about last night. I don't care about this morning. I don't care about what could have happened just 15 minutes ago in your heart. The Lord's saying, that's not going to separate my love for you. I love you. That's key, because what I want to talk about, about your responsibility, and if I could pull up that graphic again, is I want to get your focus on the right thing. I want to realign your focus on the thing that matters. 
You should not be focusing on, oh, God loves me so much, or God doesn't love me enough, or I feel like I'm out of God's presence because blah, 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 blah. This is what I want to point out to you. That your focus shouldn't be on how can I make God love me more, but rather it should be how can I love God more? How can I love God more? I want to read you just a couple scriptures. Psalms 51, Psalm 50, I'm sorry, Psalm 5, 11 through 12. I'm sorry if I confused you. Yeah, you got freaked out back there. It says this. Well, let all those rejoice who put their trust in you. That's talking to God. Let them ever shout for joy because you defended them. Let those also who love your name be joyful in you. Can I just point that out? Oh, well, go ahead. No, you're good. For you, O oh Lord. No, you're good. I, I know. I, I'll go back. For you, O oh Lord, will bless the righteous. With favor, you will surround him as with a shield. Go back to verse 11, though. I want to show you this. Let them ever shout for joy because you defended them. Let those also who love your name be joyful in you. I want to talk about having joy. Joy doesn't come because he loves you. Joy become, comes over you because you love him. Amen. Some of us are sitting here going, man, I just, I, I'm following God. I just don't have no joy in my life. I'm looking at you going, well, it's because you need to focus on your love for him. You want joy in your life. You gotta love his name. The next scripture I got right here, check this out. I love this scripture. This is a good one. 1 John 3, 10. In this, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice, everyone say practice. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. You know what it means to practice? Did I just hear the sports center app? Is there, what game's on right now? What am I missing? Braves today? Right now? Daniel. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay, okay. Yeah, I love Sports Center. You know why I had you guys say practice? Because I think sometimes we go, well, if I automatically just love God, if I just love God, then automatically I'm going to do these things. I want to just say that's hogwash. Is that what you say? Hogwash? Because I love my wife. I'm going to tell you right now, I automatically do not open up that dishwasher and see it's clean when I have a dirty dish and empty out the dishwasher. I close that thing shut. <laughs> I love my wife, but it isn't automatic. And when I read the scriptures, a lot of times we're going, man, I, I love God, but I just can't do this. He says, practice righteousness. Do you know what it means to practice? It doesn't mean that you just automatically do it. That's what the pros do. Pros practice so much that it becomes automatic. Practice means this, because some of us are going, man, I just want God to love me more. And he's like, well, then why don't you start practicing your righteousness? Well, how do I practice righteousness? You find something that's righteous, and you try it out until you get good at it. I'm going to start speaking good about people. I've noticed I'm so wicked. I talk so much trash. I'm going to make a practice. Every time I talk about someone, I'm going to only say good things about them. That's practice. Let me tell you about practice one more time. Practice is not something that's natural. Practice is something you do because it's not natural. I practice loving my wife because I love myself so much more. I know it sounds crazy, but it's true. I love myself so much. I smell my son who has a poopy diaper. I'll be laying on the floor. He could be right here in my face. I don't smell nothing. <laughs> but if I put it in my heart, no, I'm going to be the best husband in the world. I'm going to stand up. I'm going to change that diaper. I'm going to clean the clothes. I'm going to take that diaper all the way outside to the trash can. I'm not going to throw it, you know, underneath the couch or something. <laughs> yeah, I was like, I mean, like, you would do that? No, I don't want to do that. Maybe I would do that. I don't know. I don't know. Your focus shouldn't be on one that God loves you. Your focus should be, are you practicing righteousness? I'm going to go to the next scripture. 1 John 4, 19. We love God because he first loved us. You know what this point is right here? You know what I want to bring out in this little scripture right here? You're not supposed to be loving God so that he will love you. You love God because he's already loved you so much. And if you're struggling in your relationship with him, you're going, man, it's hard for, I, I, I'm just going to be real with you guys. I'm a big fan of speaking out loud. Has anyone in here ever been here at the night? How many of you guys get here at 10 o'clock? Who, well, all five of you, where are you guys at? You, know, you guys are my heroes, all five of you. I love you. Susie, thank you. What's up, baby? Riding together. Man, I, I could brag about you all day, Susie. Congratulations. Thank you. No, deal. <laughs> we 
we always talk about, let's lift our voices up. I'm not asking people to lift up their voices so God would hear them. I'm saying, come on, don't you love him so much? Don't you see how much he loves you? Don't you want to shout? Man, when this music starts, I want to talk about Wednesday night really quick. We're jamming on Wednesday night, right? Wednesday night, we're just, the music was bumping. I mean, we were having a good time. We're singing the same lyrics over and over, but we couldn't stop. You know, it was like, thank you, thank you. That's all, you know, we're just saying that. But bro, can I tell you, when we're, when we're thanking God and we're praising him, I couldn't help but dance. I was up there like, boom, baby, boom, baby, bam. I don't know what that dance is, man. It's kind of like a thriller. (laughs) But I legitimately don't dance because of it makes God happy or it's going to stir your heart up. You know why I dance? Because I realize how much he loves me and I just got to be righteous with him. I got to dance with him. I don't just pray out loud because I think there's more power in the air. I pray out loud because I'm going, man, if you're willing to come down on this earth and die on that cross and rise again and then send your Holy Spirit out, then God, I'm going to shout your name out because I recognize how much you love us. I want to encourage you really quick. Your focus should not be, does God love me? Your focus should be, he loves me so much, do I even believe it? Because if you do, then you'll love him back. I got another scripture for you. John 14, 11. Believe me that I am the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. That wasn't it, but that's a great verse. <sighs> Don't you love the Bible? <laughs> Is that all I give you? I think it's the next verse. I think it's verse 12. It says this, whoever keeps my commands, love me. Yes, that was, oh, verse 23. Oh, that's what it was, thanks. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And my Father will love them, and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words. And the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. You know what he's trying to tell you and I? Don't worry about my love for you. That's a done deal. But if you love me, then you need to start practicing keeping my word. Can I say that again to you? Because I think too many of us are going, no, God loves me, I'm okay to do what I want. But God's saying, if you love me, then you're gonna start practicing righteousness. You're gonna start looking at the word and saying, that's sin, then I'm gonna practice not doing that. If that's righteousness, I'm gonna start practicing that. What does your word tell me to do? You want me to go evangelize Jesus? Well, I'm gonna focus not on whether or not you love me, but do I really love you? Because if I love you, I'm gonna keep your word. I gotta go tell people about Jesus. He does not love me, does not keep my words. John, uh, Matthew 6, 24. This one's, this one's tough. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he'll be loyal to the one and despise the other. And he says, you cannot serve God and mammon. Let me just tell you about this. Your focus doesn't need to be whether or not God loves you. Your focus needs to be whether or not you love him. Because if you love anybody else, he's saying it won't work. You can't have two masters. He says, you'll be loyal to one and despise the other. You know how many times I see people, even in my own life, just like my my last story about the kid with the demon in him. Can I tell you how many times that I was trying to serve two masters and at the same time trying to figure out why I didn't understand God all the way. Trying at the same time trying to figure out, God, why can't I get this demon out of this kid? And then I'm sitting there thinking, maybe it's because you're not pleased with me or satisfied with me. And the Lord's saying, no, 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 no. If you have two masters, then you have no master. If you have two masters, then you're loyal only to one of them, and it wasn't me, Tom. Your focus shouldn't be on whether or not he loves you. It needs to be whether or not you're serving him. Next verse, 1 John 4, 7 through 8. This will be my last one. This is actually where I'm landing. Beloved, Let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Our focus should not be about winning God over. Our focus should be, am I loving my brothers and sisters? Even the ones who hate me. Even the ones who are jerks. How many guys know some jerks? Anyone in here know some jerks? Come on, I know some jerks. I'm looking right at you. I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. I know people who are mean. I know people who deserve bad things. I know people who deserve 
bad treatment. You know what the scripture says about loving your brother? This is crazy to me. He corrects the Corinthians. He says, don't take them into lawsuits amongst the world because what a terrible witness that is. It's better to be ripped off. You know what I'm saying? He's addressing someone. I'm just going to make this story up, okay? Could you imagine if I walked in? I went over to Daniel, and Daniel has a bunch of land. And I said, Daniel, I'm going to take your land from you. <laughs> you know? I started building my house on his land. This is a stupid story. Why am I telling you? This is a dumb story. I'm not going to use that example. Daniel, that's a dumb story. I'm sorry. Let me just say it this way. Someone got so wronged that legally in the Bible, they had the right to take it to court. And Paul writes to them and says, it's better to be ripped off than have division amongst you. I'm looking at you going, you know what your focus should be? Not winning over God, but the person you're having a problem with, you should start focusing. I need to love this person. Because if I try to love him, and it goes, I want to say this, everything, I said this earlier, and I should really emphasize this more, it goes against everything natural in you. I want to say this, Christianity is not a natural thing for your body. You're going to want to sin. You're going to have desires that go against what God wants you to do. Can I say that to you? Because I think we've got this idea that this, this is like some cow, you're going to change you, and you're going to be perfect. And God said, no, 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 in spite of your sin, I died for you. In the midst of your death, I came for you. And I'm mentioning this because I think it's really important that we understand that this isn't about, oh, I feel like doing something. I don't feel like doing something. This is literally about getting up and focusing on what you're supposed to do and doing it and pushing through even the feelings. And the reason why I want to end on that scripture about loving your brother and why you should realign, what focus, or realign your focus on what matters is that division amongst the brethren is always a case of you not loving someone and they not loving you. And I want to say this division only takes one person to break off. But you and I have a duty to love people well and look at them with our hearts full and say, I want to be like God. I know him. He's loved me so much. And I want to be someone, when I get to heaven, he says, well done, good and faithful servant. Not, I never knew you. And I would line up my focus and say, God, I'm going to practice righteousness. God, I want to figure out what your word says. I'm going to follow it, whatever it takes. And I might screw up, but that's not the point. You love me in the midst of my sin. That's not the point. The point is, I'm going to start practicing starting today to fight against my flesh, to fight against my desires, to fight against even my hurts. Even the things that have been wrongfully done to me and I have all the right to be upset about it, I'm going to fight against it, God, because my goal is not to make you love me. My goal is to make myself love you. And my goal is that everything inside of me wants to love what's in the world. Everything inside of me wants to love sin and hatred and this idea of justice that isn't his type of justice. And I want to love this, but I want to fight it because my focus is not you loving me. My focus is me loving you because you've already loved me. You loved me in my filth. You loved me in my shame. You were there in the nights of my perverseness. You were there in my thoughts, in my wickedness. And still, you said, it won't separate me from you. And today, I want to challenge you guys today to get your focus back. Say, it's my turn, God, to practice righteousness. It's my turn, God, to follow your word. It's my turn, God, to lay down my offenses and love those who are against me. Because, God, I want to know you. It's my turn, Father, not to let my feelings or my desires or my emotions or even the natural things. I'm saying natural as in the things you're born into to direct me anymore, God. I will push against those because I have one job today and that job is to draw near to you. If drawing near to you means I have to step away from this sickness or I have to step away from this kind of thought pattern or if I need to step away from these kind of people who are surrounded in gossips, if I need to step away from friends who dwell in sin, if I need to step away from my own foolishness and condemnation of my heart, if I have to step away from the idea that you don't love me, if I have to step away from the idea that I'm not worthy, then God, I am going to do it because my focus is getting closer, not impressing you. There's one more scripture. I got two more scriptures. The first one is this. He says, all your goodness 
All your righteousness is like filthy rags to him. He's, in other words, he's saying, stop trying to impress me. I don't need to be impressed. You need me, so draw into me. But this is the last scripture I'm going to read, and I'm going to, I'll stand up, we're going to pray, and we're going to close. It's a scripture in Zephaniah. We never read this in church. A minor prophet, 317. It says, the Lord God is in your midst. And then it says, the mighty one will save. I want to stop right there. The mighty one will save. God is here. God is with you. Even when you're in the bad places, he says, the mighty one will save. He's in your midst. And then it says this, he will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with his love. And he will rejoice over you with singing. And if you get into that translation, I want you to say this. It actually says, with shouting out his voice. I want to end on this verse because my whole purpose of this sermon was to just solidify something in your heart. God loves you. He's in your midst. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He's not sitting there going, oh, okay, Randy, I guess you're okay. He's going, no, no, this is my God. I love him. He says, I will quiet you with my, his love. He says, I will rejoice over you. That means he's singing over you. Oh, Leah. He's got a better voice than me. She is my beloved one. I'm trying to get something clear to you. He's not upset at you. He's not defeated by you. Your wickedness isn't too much for him. He wants you to focus on something else. Getting yourself right with him because he's been so good to you. Amen. Let's rise to our feet. Rise to our feet. We're going to close this thing out. Stretch it out, y'all. It feels so good to stand and stretch. After all that sitting, right? There it is. Yeah, get that vibe going. God loves you. It says this in scriptures. He even calls you by name. You're not disqualified. But today, your focus isn't to win him over. Your focus is to make yourself in love with him. So I'm going to pray a simple prayer over you. That today you would leave this place and you would realign yourself. Say, God, your job is done. Now my job is next. I'm going to get myself righteous. I'm going to get out. Can I just say it? Out of my sexual morality. I'm going to break up with the people I shouldn't be with. I'm going to break up with my thoughts. And today I'm declaring and practicing righteousness. Let's close our eyes for a second. Father, I pray with every eye closed, Jesus, we can focus in on you. That Jesus, today, we would be people who realign our focus to the thing that matters. You love us. And you love us so much, Father, that, God, we want to love you back. And that our love for you, Jesus, we're going to start practicing in our righteousness. We're going to start obeying your word. We're going to start going with your commandments, Jesus. Father, we're even going to let things go in our life, Father, that have been binding us up, God, because we don't want to let it go. God, we're going to get rid of our other masters today. Because, Father, today, today, Jesus, we got our focus back. It's no longer about making you love us, but it's about making us love you. So Father, I pray strength. I pray courage. Father, I pray for might over everyone in this room that every single person in here, Jesus, will walk this week knowing that they too love you because you first loved us. We hope that you enjoyed today's sermon. Once again, if you'd like to support this ministry, log on to www.dreamcenterchurch.com to help us advance the kingdom of God. And check us out on the Church Center app and all your favorite social media platforms. Until next time, be blessed and go do the great things God has called you to do.